Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 28 of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwyer and Hemostaff saga. By me. Well, we're going to be starting at page 291 in the chapter entitled Dreadmore Forest, where the party is being attacked by two monstrous beasts. They're in big trouble. Okay. Carmen was the heroine of the day. Riding Allinger, she was a deadly halberd wielding adversary. Focusing upon the forward creature, she tried to lead it away from Tarek's vulnerable body. Allinger was powerful, swift, and well trained, and each time that the monster charged them, Carmen would wound it, and Allinger would rear away to safety. She harassed the beast relentlessly, while Kalor and Dal fired arrow after arrow into it. But the creatures had survived for years in their wilderness environment because of their cunning and great strength. The monster that Carmen faced was an animal guided by hunger, created by its master to hunt and to kill. The arrows piercing its hide were driving it to new heights of rage, and when she turned for another rush, it also charged and didn't stop. The trees prevented Alger from evading the beast, and Carmen realized that she had been outwitted. The bare thing barreled into them with incredible force. Its claws raked her face beneath her helm and knocked her to the ground beneath Alger's collapsing form. If she had moved any less quickly, she would have been crushed beneath the two animals, but she rolled with the blow and somehow managed to regain her fallen halberd. Lunging backward, she struck a tree. The gigantic creature was churning over Alger's flailing body charging toward her in a ground-tearing rush. Looking frantically about herself, she saw only an unyielding curtain of trees, an impenetrable barrier from which she had no escape. Searching her mind for anything that could help her escape death, her father's teachings came back to her in a rush. Driving her halberd spear point into the tree behind her, she lifted its opposing sword blade, setting herself against the tree trunk to meet the beast's charge. It was croaking its horrible hunting cries, and its eyes gripped her very soul in an embrace of terror. The collision was titanic. Her halberd proved to be no match for the beast's great mass charging at full speed, and even as her blade penetrated into its heart, its shaft bowed out, bowed outward and snapped beneath the incredible impact. There was no stopping its momentum. She couldn't remember ever being hit quite so hard in all her life. The monster reeked of rotting flesh. Its berserk death throes struck her in a myriad of hammering blows that she hardly felt. Her world went dark. The second bare thing was just as dangerous as the first. There was no halberd-wielding fighter left to meet it. Instead, there were two skilled archers, a dwarf, and two Halfar swordsmen, all of whom were tired of being dealt one unlucky hand after another. Their two pack horses were dying, and the beast was standing over them like a wolf guarding its kill. It turned its attention toward Kerr, its appetite far from satisfied. His heart was a black well of grief and anger. Many of his friends had been mutilated on Corindor, and all the animals that had carried him so far had been killed. It was too much for one small dwarf to bear. Corin Koth was calling to him, and so he drew the axe forth from his back sheath and waded in beneath the creature's paws. Prince Loren's shield was upon his left, his battle axe in his right. If he'd been alone, then he would surely have fallen beneath the savage strength of the strange predator. But the beast was being attacked from all sides, and he couldn't concentrate on any single opponent. He drove forward with all his strength, wielding Korinkoth as if he'd been born to it. Each time the monster struck at him, his razor-sharp axe stung its terrible paws. Kurragoth sung a symphony of death in his heart. With each blow of his axe, the well of grief within him diminished somewhat, but that well was very, very deep indeed. He doubted that he would ever be free of the sadness of loss, but for now, there was a blood debt to be paid, and he meant to collect. Nothing was going to stand in his way. The beast reared directly above him, 
its great beak descended to devour him. Its arms swung out, swung in for a crushing hug, and then once and twice Corin Koth licked out. The monster reared back to scream, but could not, for its throat had been bared to the bone. Kerr hewed on as the lifeless creature began to fall. Severing its leg tendons, he tore into its body with ruthless sufficiency until the beast was lying still. His chest heaved with exertion's breath. Searching for more enemies to fight, he was disappointed when he found none. When he was done, he stood atop of its torn belly, cleaned his axe on his fur, and said, Kur is hungry still. The creatures were dead, but their victory was costly. Tarek and Carmen were unconscious, and the two pack horses had died long before Dartin could have helped them. Tarek's leather armor had absorbed much of the beast's strike, but four great scarring lines of blood ran from his right shoulder to his left hip, and there was a great lump on his head from his fall. Windrunner was limping feebly, and he bled from several deep claw wounds. Alger and the other horses had escaped with only minor injuries, and those could easily be tended to. Windrunner will live, Dartin said. I'll heal him, but we must see to Carmen and Tarek first. Leander carefully removed Tarek's armor and cleaned his wounds while the others went to Carmen's aid. The gigantic beast lay fully on top of her, and only her left hand was visible beneath it. Quickly, Dal said, bring Alger and some rope. Tying a rope from his saddle horn to the beast's left foreleg, the mighty stallion was able to roll the creature off her. She came to moments after they freed her. Her armor had saved her life. Her ribs were bruised, but they weren't broken, and only her face had been badly harmed. Karina assisted Dartin. She brought fresh water and started a fire to boil it. Carmen cried as they cleaned her torn face. She knew that she was badly hurt, and most certainly disfigured forever. Fear not, Dartin said. Odin favors the brave. Before he could call upon the power of the runes, he had to stitch together the torn remnants of her left cheek. He was afraid that his magic would leave her with terrible scars if he did not. The All-Father's power to heal was limitless, but the abilities of his priest were not. Carmen's flesh was numb with shock, and it was merciful that she didn't feel the full extent of his handiwork. Using all this skill and intuition, he finally summoned Odin's rune to knit her lacerated flesh back together. But despite his best efforts, she would bear scars for life. When her pain was gone, she raised her hands to her face and sat silently. She knew the dangers of her chosen profession, and she didn't cry out. But what greater horror could there be for a woman than the loss of beauty? Do I look horrible, Karina? You are just as beautiful as you were yesterday. Don't worry. You just look a little different now. The scars are thin, like the lines of a painter's brush. Your loveliness still shines through. But Carmen was not so sure. Leander and Dartin worked quickly to help the ranger. His head wound had stopped swelling after Leander had administered one of Grog's healing potions to him. But blood still ebbed from the long, deep gashes across his chest. Dartin called upon the healing rune once more. With his hands, he inscribed it, and with his voice, he invoked it. Tarek's pain became his pain, and Tarek's wounds his wounds. He ignored his mind's warning and focused his will. The times were desperate. The power of the runes came from the heavens themselves, and he was perhaps Odin's last follower on Tempest. His faith steadied him as Tarek's hurts became his own, and Odin was with him to remove those pains. Somehow he found the strength to remain conscious and in control. When he knew that Tarek was out of danger, he used the last of his strength to heal the horses. The price of Odin's healing rune was exhaustion. Not just the fatigue brought on by lack of sleep, but the incredible weariness following the experience of great pain and physical sacrifice. He collapsed to the ground and could not be roused. He would have to be tied to his horse and led. By the time they reassembled, it was well past sundown. 
the orc's drums beat in their haunting rhythm from deep within the forest, and they knew that there was no time to spare for rest. Transferring the supplies from the pack horses to the other animals, they prepared to move out. Tarek was once again awake and nearly himself, but his armor was a complete loss. Unpacking his spare shirt, he remembered his extra sword. I keep a second sword, Karina. It is weighted for men, but you may try to wield it if you wish. In this dangerous world, no one should go weaponless. It was a man-sized longsword. Not a proper match for her small frame, but it was the only extra blade in the party. She accepted the sword and scabbard without complaint, and brief, briefly tested its balance. It is a good sword, and heavy, but not elven made. I thank you. Tara could tell that it wasn't the first time that she'd handled a weapon. It seemed to him that she tried to conceal her true ability by limiting her exhibition. Perhaps one day he would find out why. They rode in pairs. Branded bore Dartin, Aiden carried Leander and Kerr, and Dow and Karina rode upon his mare. Windrunner transported Tarek and Carmen rode Alger. Escaping Dreadmore, they entered the orc's vast northern tundra region. It was a great rolling plain, filled with short tangled trees and dense undergrowth. Winter was near, and snow and ice clung in patches to the branches of trees and earthbound places hidden from the sun. Tarek led them on throughout the night, and their path was filled with the perils of half-frozen quagmires, unseen branches, and unknown enemies. Tarek found a suitable campsite in the hour just before dawn. It was a low, sheltered dell, large enough to conceal their animals and themselves. He volunteered for the first guard shift and ordered them all to get what sleep that they could. They slept the dreamless sleep of exhaustion and were forced to awaken long before they were rested. Tarek knew that the orcs were gaining on them, and so they were forced to ride on while it was still morning. The howls of wolves echoed from the south, filling them with dread. Fear sped them on their way. The tundra foliage was the brown of late autumn, and the trees stooped skeletal and gray. Despite the bleak landscape, they passed by numerous migratory birds and other animals preparing themselves for the coming winter. Tarek pointed out several large hairs beneath a bent aspen. Their fur turns from the brown of summer to the white of winter. They are adorable, Karina said. Their white feet look like snowshoes. Tarek looked to Leander, and they both agreed. Your name is a good one, Karina, for here and ever after. May, be, may they be known as snowshoes. Dow was able to shoot two of them for dinner and throughout the day they spotted many more. In fact, all the wildlife around them wore their winter coats. They saw white, wool, they saw white wolves, foxes, and snow-white fowl, much like chickens. <clears throat> Tarek showed them all how to hunt the birds by hurling handfuls of pebbles at the roosting fowl. It was not as easy as it looked, and if they only added three birds to their stock, and they only added three birds to their stock after a long effort. Further study of the terrain would have to wait, however, for the orcs foreboding drums were echoing across the great plateau, leading their enemies toward them. I know the orcs of this region, Tarek said. They are called the drums of doom. This tundra is their holy land. Beware what lies behind every rock, bush, or tree, for the orcs are the masters of ambush. Their long journey was beginning to wear upon them, and their horses' hooves trod warily beneath them. Racing northward as fast as they dared, they traveled by moonlight and hid by day. Soon one day blended into another of like kind, and only their comradeship sustained them. The ranger used all his skills to escape the eyes of their adversaries. Living off what game they could hunt while they traveled, they built their fires in low pits to conceal their light and smoke. Tarek feared that the smell of a cook fire might lead the orcs to them, but the days were growing colder, and they needed its heat to survive. Halfway across the tundra, it began to snow. Each day that followed brought new squalls and several inches of accumulation. I pray that our trail 
will not now be found, Tarek said, but if our lead is enough, the snow could save us. Moving ever north, they came to a high point in the plain. To the northwest, they spied the Orkan army moving toward a great pyramid, looming, looming ominously above the plain. It was clearly the largest singular construction that any of them had ever seen. The pyramid was not built by the orcs, Tarek said, but they have dwelled there for centuries. Who built it, none can say, but the orc's strength there is supreme. The statue which stands before it is a monument to their demon god. Its image was terrible to behold, pot-bellied and huge. It possessed a ram's head and long curled horns. Its eyes were black and hollow, and its mouth hung open, revealing razor-like predatory teeth. Its immensely muscled limbs ended in wickedly clawed hands and feet. Here was a god befitting of the orcs. Here was the very beast from the blackest pit of hell. They had hoped that their flight would lead them into safer territory, but instead their every move was proving more perilous than their last. The orcs could lie in wait from, from, for them over every hill or around any bend in the terrain. But Tarek led them well, and their forms were never visible above the plain. They moved forward with as much stealth as they could for several more days and passed over dangerous snow-covered ponds and half-frozen bogs. The horses grew weaker by the day. They were quickly reaching their limits. Approaching the final few miles of the region, Tarek began to find fresh signs of orc patrols and he knew that their escape might soon require a fight. They spotted several companies of orcs and each time they narrowly escaped detection. Tarek drove them ahead at a ruthless pace, hoping that they could find sanctuary in the northern mountains. The red orc's drums echoed across the land, and Tarek felt sure that they were closing the noose around them. The party had reached the foothills when they once again heard the baying calls of the orc's hounds. Their trail had been found. We must ride, Tarek said, and they fled, exhausted riders upon horses nearly spent, racing into the northern reaches. Despite their best efforts at speed, the orcs and their hounds never left them in the race. Looking back from a hilltop vantage point, Tarek saw the reason why. The orcs are no longer afoot. They ride their Goru. Goru? They are huge wild oxen with wide curled horns and thick bodies covered in dark hairy hides. They are not as swift as horses, but they could take greater extremes of cold and they are immensely strong. Where do they come from? This is their native land. They can find ample sustenance beneath the deep snow. We won't be able to outrun them over this terrain. Maybe we can lose them in these hills, Carmen said. The dogs have our scent. They are rested and we are not. Our only chance is to make a stand. And let's ride to the head of this valley. Maybe we'll find a defensible position. That high cleft at the end of the valley, between the two mountains, should meet our needs. Ride for it. We'll build a hasty defense. It was a narrow pass beneath, between mountains, with steep, steep slopes and, restricted boulder -strewn, and a restricted boulder-strewn approach. Kerr, can you fell these trees here and here so that they cross the main path? I'll need the help of two more lumberjacks to drop them in time. Dartin, Leander, lend a hand. Tarek and Dow, take the west slope. Kalor, you will take the east. Kerr, you and your men will defend the barricade. Improve it while you will. Karina, you and I will lead the horses ahead to that pine grove and return. They tied their horses loosely within the wood, so that the animals could free themselves if faced with some unforeseen danger. With Kerr's help, Dartin and Leander felled two sizable oaks across the main approach, and behind them they prepared a hasty defense. Tarek and Dal found a good position on the westward slope. The advantage offered them a grand view of the dropping valley and helped to conceal and protect them as well. Setting their arrows out before them in the snow, they drove the heads downward so that they stood on end for a quick draw. They checked their weapons and they stood on end. They checked their weapons and the sinew of their bowstrings. 
The cold could dry and crack the tendon, making it brittle, and such an oversight could be fatal. Kalor found an excellent position beneath the arch of a weathered evergreen tree. Cutting several long pine boughs from a distant tree, he used them to further conceal his fighting position. Preparing his small bow and arrows, he laid them out before himself. He removed his backpack and opened the top flap so that he could easily remove any scrolls or other items that he might need. His mind raced with unrealized fears as the growing gem at his throat blazed its warning. His cowl was closed tightly, concealing its light, but he could feel the hum of its magic against his skin. They had overcome many obstacles, but this time might be different. The orcs were coming with a large force. They wouldn't be drunk or caught by surprise. They would be the enemies that had challenged Tarek and others like him for centuries. He was exhausted and terribly cold, but there was no room for such conditions in the coming fight. They would need his spells to overcome the terrible odds against them, and so he prepared the witches' scrolls, reviewing the incantations that they contained. Breathing deeply, he calmed himself and focused on the spell formula that he'd memorized. He wouldn't let them down. He was trying to warm his cold hands, but the winter wind defied him. Remembering the warm hearth of one-eyed jacks, he wished that he was there. We may need some more snow over here, Kerr said. This central path will probably meet the brunt of it. I'll cut some more heavy branches, Dartin said, while you two finish building the barricade. They were fortifying the felled trees by intertwining large branches and piling snow. When they had done all that they could, they prepared their longbows and made sure their swords were at the ready. Kerr crouched beside them with his crossbow, and his face seemed haunted and somehow eager. Carmen couldn't fight with Alja this day, for her halberd's handle was broken, and despite his tremendous strength, Alja was tired. Joining the men at the barricade, they watched and waited. Just like old times, eh, Keg? Let us hope that this time will be just like old times. He was smiling as he said it, but whether it was to calm her, because he truly doubted whether they would live or not, remained unknown. May Vanamoinen grant us strength and courage. Don't worry, Kerr said to her, for Klangan and two will be with us this day. And Odin as well, Dartin said. Perhaps today I will earn the right to sit beside my father at Odin's table. The wind blows cold, Leander said, but the mountains guard our flanks. I feel that there are eyes watching us and wishing us well. The gods will remember this battle. We now face fates unyielding hand. Then may we make it yield, Carmen said. May it yield, they echoed. And that's where we'll begin episode 29 next time at the top of page 300. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And remember, as always, read Curse Rage, part one of the Dwarahim Staff Saga by me and the accompanying novels. Thank you and have a great night.